my favorite topic in the world. So, actually, we will talk about secondary structures. So it's only half the way. Um, but um, at least for many biochemists, structure is always a key thing. It's, it's a, unfortunately, we are in the many geneticists who don't care about structure at all, but for biochemistry, market biology, uh, from Boston Crick and on, it's really structure has explained a lot of biology. On the molecular level, so really structure helps a lot. So I will talk today. I will maybe with introduction to protein structure and structure prediction. I will oh, this link is wrong. I will talk about secondary structure prediction, and there are three links on the web page, on the on the mono page. Uh, well, these methods I will not talk about, but basically these three are mainly from a historical perspective are important. I don't. I know we're not talking about molecular modeling. I will do that tomorrow. And uh, so, so why do we need structure prediction? This is, of course, the same reason actually because we, why do we need structures in biology? I mean, what's in Crick DNA structure is the obvious reason why structure we explain nothing. Suddenly, when they made a model of it, which was a prediction to a large extent, of course, of experimental evidence that put in, you did it wasn't. It's obviously explained how information could be inherited from one cell to the next cell. In DNA, you have perfect pairs. And it's, it's, it was before that. I mean, I think there is a small sentence in the last part of the paper. I mean, it's on the one page paper. I think it hasn't slipped our mind that this model explains how inheritance could proceed. So it's. it's, it's, it's it's, it's so obvious. I mean, it's, it was an obvious thing. So I really, DNA structure is obviously what you do. But there was also, of course, there are lots of structures I mean, uh, that you, you understand the functions of um, many proteins much better by having structure and some the ribosome, if it looks like without having structure, would be hard to see, to see all parts of that. But also, of course, that the, uh, so structure prediction, of course, has somehow the same reasons. That you, if you have, because you call, if you can't get a structure experimentally, you need to use predictions. And uh, but also it gives you a lot of um, uh, additional information about uh, b drug binding and so on. And also signal methods even for engineering new problems. If you understand, you can really say that the centers have, have protein folds and we can maybe design a new protein that doesn't exist and so on. So uh, for applications are like you can do a drug. A common reason, particularly in industry, is drug binding. So basically, hardly any drugs that are developed today do not have a structural component. So basically, you try to get the structure of the, your target molecule, and often you try to optimize some small molecule that fits into a perfect pocket. It's not always the case, and of course, historically many drugs that didn't have it, but it really is a big help in structural, structural or in, in the drug development. And of course, there are a lot of methods that are used, uh, uh, not only for the design of it, but also for other reasons. Uh, actually, another reason that has been a lo 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 long thing for a long time is actually finding homologs. So basically, in many cases, it has been that you have found that proteins are related by looking at the structures. You see the structures look the same. It's, uh, so you had this concept saying that structure is more conserved than sequence, which is probably true to some extent, but it's not really obvious how to measure it. But, um, but there are many cases that, when, when I, particularly historically, when, that when you found a structure, you realize, oh, this, this looks like that. So they must, must have a common ancestor to, pro, to the proteins, and then they, you can figure it out afterwards, and you realize that they are most likely the same. There are cases where you, when, you, when you don't really, uh, when you look the same, and you don't think they have no common ancestors also, but that can always be debated somehow. And nowadays, with all the sequence data, so if you use the sequence data in a good way, it's not so much more efficient to look for distance homology by structure than by sequence. There are cases where the structure changes and the sequence is similar, and there are cases when the structure stays the same and sequence is diverged very fast. 
but at least historically. But, but also, and also, but also, if you're understanding evolution in other perspectives, like how are things added and deleted from parts, and you have insertion of domains, and etc. and so on. So, that, so it has been important for understanding proof in evolution. And it's also been important for some kind of classification. That's basically because you have been able to classify these structures into distant homologs, you can classify them into groups, like p fun but more hierarchical, and then you can do that for characterize, characterize different genomes. So structure prediction could be useful. However, it is not that easy. So basically, we know from experiments in the 70s already, from Anderson and, and others, that in principle, all the information for a protein structure is in, is in a sequence. So really, if we are basically, I mean, the, the experiments are basically, you can take isozyme in his case, and you can unfold it, you can boil it, or put urea or the pH, it unfolds, and you can get the fold back. And it does it all the time. And basically, you can do it in many different conditions, and if you just take away this, put the condition correctly, and it falls back. So it means that it's a stable free energy minimum that is the folded state of structure, at least of lysosine, lysosine. And or quite most structures that are, except that are protons it doesn't work like that, but it's quite a large group of protons works like that. The problems of course, there are thousands of atoms, so rotatable bonds, solvents, etc. So if you ask take the possible number of confirmations for a protein is basically maybe three to, to the power of the length of the sequence so there's a few hundred so three to the power of hundred or something like that which is a huge number which is bigger than the um, atoms in the universe or something like that so basically there's no way that you can search all possible confirmations even with the simplified models so the folding must be somehow be guided so it doesn't search all confirmations because they wouldn't have time to fold it out. And folding normally occurs in milliseconds or seconds, time scales is rapid, rather fast. It's faster fold than there are slower folders. And, but we should also say, so generally we have a structural protein, but we should also remember that actually that is not really correct, because actually it's quite dynamic. But there are, there are vibrations, there are rotations, there are uh, partial unfolding and folding back and stuff like that. So even understanding that is of course also important, but in to a pretty good approximation in many cases, protein can be seen as one single structure. At least it's a good approximation for many cases at least. So I don't know how much everybody knows about proteins, but I will, I will just do a quick repetition. We all know, that, uh, I guess at least I know, and I think most of you know, that proteins are amino acids. And you know that they have a side chain and a backbone, and the side chain exists in 20 different versions. And uh, plus a number of uh, there are other variations that occur later, you have selenium, methionine, and so on. But basically, it's 20 different versions. And these twenty amino acids can be divided into a number of groups. So you have a set of uh, hydrophobic ones. Well, some of them are not so hydrophobic, but at least they're small. And you have a set of uh, aromatic ones. You can say they, well, these three at least. Uh, you have uh, positively charged groups. And the histidine depends on the pH, of course. It has an origin. And negative charge ones, and you have a set of polar ones that are uh, have polar group, but not not really charged. So they, they have different properties. They see the different sizes and etc. And different things. They they they, they are different. And of course, from difference between the glycine and the arginine is quite huge. You have like this is. Why well, this is one hydrogen? This is uh, twenty atoms or fifteen atoms. The size difference is huge, and also some are very hydrophobic, and some are charged. So these are the major forces. We know that they're chiral, so they all uh, the natural occurring ones are basically all L amino acids. So they look like that, they're not like that. 
there are a few cases that you make the amino acids. There's nothing fundamental reason there, uh, why that, but it was the nature started using one type and that has been propagating. There are a few specific uh, cases we have the amino acids, but they're, they're not, they're more like, they're not really key, the proteins, are, they're more things that are synthesized. And we know that the, the peptide bond is very specific. You, you have one amino acid and two amino acids and fuse them together. And you form a peptide bond. And you basically have one to three bonds between each of these. But one of these bonds is not really, it's not, it's not really fixed. So you basically have a peptide plane here between the nitrogen and the carbon. And it'll Oops, but the, so the, this is basically a plane here because of polar uh, interactions here. So this is basically this, this electron is distributed between here, so it's almost like a double bond there. And then you have phi and psi angle. So basically, you, you can basically describe the ba ba backward conformation with only two variables. You have a rotation around this bond, a rotation around this bond. The bond length and the bond angles are rather fixed. They are perfect, and also exactly. 120 degrees in every case, so 109 degrees, they are, but they are rather fixed. You, that's not too bad approximation. Mm. So to describe the backbone confirmation, you need two numbers for each residue. And this is a, then was a lot of work by <coughs> uh, well, a lot of work in the 50s and 60s. For people to study and, and the key thing here is that these backbones can form secondary structures. So you can basically divide. Uh, yes. So you can you, you can divide like these structures into different levels, and particularly have a secondary structure that is kind of forming the from both local interactions and doesn't really care about things that are far away. And then people use called the social structure to fold them everything and coordinate if you uh, have even have interaction with other folks involved. You can actually skip this. Well, there I guess too. So ideally, of course, we would like to have this structure. We have it predicted. And uh, this is what Gunnar hinted that there are methods that can get to this to this structure nowadays. They are uh, pretty good. And, uh, that just the last few years they have evolved. But for the sake of uh, knowledge, and it's, we actually going to start here today, talk about secondary structure predictions. But in general, there has been some kind of division of, of, of structure prediction methods into the, to, to, to different levels, and one group is secondary structure prediction, but you also have, we'll talk about tomorrow, is homology modeling, comparative modeling, where you basically find homology between two proteins, one that's in the structure of and one you want to sequence of, and you basically copy the information from the, your structural template into the other sequence. And then there's some intermediate method called fold recognition that basically said, yeah, it's basically comparative modeling, but on a more distant scale. And what Gunnar hinted at is basically what some people call ab initio or de novo protein structure prediction. So basically, really, you just take the sequence and you try to fold it. And that has been seen to be very, very hard and basically impossible, except in small cases, but there's been a lot of progress there. So why should you do second structure prediction? And historically, it was a reason for maybe the last three days too difficult, so we, and maybe we can even actually do it stepwise. We started to have the secondary structure elements of a protein, and then can put them together. That has not proven to be very efficient. People don't really do it. But... Um, um, the, the, the secondary structure prediction is used in many other sources, particularly for homology modeling and other things. It's used as a part of the pipelines of them, but, uh, but they are not so important as people thought it would be maybe 20 years ago. But it's, from a biomathematical perspective, they are actually quite interesting because they are really shows what you can do with just. Uh, yes, machine learning and and some knowledge about the structures and some knowledge about the problem so basically 
you want to find some patterns, you want to find, you remember the multiple sequence arms looked at, you can see patterns that look like how to beat the sheets and helices. But which ones? We know that there are some minas that have a preference for being helix or a strand. And this we know basically the reason for that is basically if you have a strand, you have limited space. So you can't really have sort of things that have two brand side chains would like to be there, etc. Or, or because of. Um, and we also know that patterns, as we said, we had this like uh, every second residue could be had a four because every second could be had a filling. Yeah, yeah, most likely a sheet because you can get into that. Uh, in general, we also know for, uh, for, for multiple things like conservation. Basically, if you have uh, alignments that are conserved, you can conserve them more likely to be in structures than being loops, etc. So there's a lot of information here that we could get from a sequence or from multiple sequence alignment. And they have all been used, and I will try to tell them basically three different generations of secondary structure speaking methods from 1970s on. And they are based on both advances in computers. But also in the large thing also in the type of data that are access, uh, accessible. So we know we have basically a few types of secondary structure elements. Often we talk about beta strands, they can be parallel or parallel, but it's basically the same strands. We have helices, we have turns of proteins or, or bands, but often you divide these, put these together, so you basically say you only have three classes. So the main general problem is it describes as three different problems helix, sheet, and loops. But of course, it's not always obvious when a helix or a sheet end ends. So in actually most PDB files, you have an end, a framework saying this is a helix, this is a sheet, etc. In at least in the old ones, it was very much defined by the biologists themselves. And it's not so difficult, but you're all, always going to have Critical problems at exactly when does the helix end and when it comes from a loop. What, what do, you do you define this? So this is the last rest of the helix. And so one thing that actually happened was that people developed programs that look at the hydrogen bonds in particular. And two of the most popular ones of these is being stride that checks, that classifies the protein structure into, into secondary structure elements. Mm. And uh, yeah, so the, 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 actually probably you, if you want to predict something, it's probably easy, better to use some, some of these methods, one of these methods or something else, and you do that as your criteria instead of using the word visual, because it's going to vary from person to person. But what you could ask first, why are, why, why are we not just using the five angles? We know that this backbone here. A phi angle, psi angle, and an omega angle. The omega angle we can basically say is basically always 180 degrees. Well, some pro lines are not, but we ignore this. And we know that we basically have uh, that all these angles are not allowed. It's not that you have complete freedom. And this was developed, uh, discovered by Ramachandran in, I don't know, in the 70s maybe. So if you take phi and psi, you can basically see that only some regions here are allowed in this phi size space. And basically, this is an alpha helix, this is a beta sheet, and these are loops. But the methods that use uh, this, this is being stride, uh, basically, you could just take these angles here, here, but they actually use other criteria also. I can see it here, you can see that you have hydrogen bonds, or certain types, etc. And so if you combine this information together, you can actually classify the structures second structure of a protein quite accurately. Uh, and also these phi psi maps look very different for each amino acid type. How do you get the angle? Because I know you can construct from a channel angle from uh from I mean crystallography data. This is this is not this is the hydro angle. Yeah. I mean, you basically have four bonds. Yeah, but I mean how do you obtain them? Because from from crystal structures, you can of course measure them, right? But if you don't have the crystal structure, no. I mean, this is for this is for this, if you have a crystal structure. Oh, okay. This is so this is your training set. Oh, how, right. how to okay. construct the training set. Yeah. I mean, there are, there has been methods that try to predict phi psi angles directly. It's just that it's uh, and I don't know if it's hard, but basically, 
you don't gain anything from predicting secondary structures. You, you, I think you get slightly better performance if you try to predict the secondary structures directly and, in, in, and if, if you classify three groups of five angles. Because certainly, in particularly, a loop region could have some residues that are in this uh, here also. So, that's, so that classification is harder. It doesn't mean it's the hydrogen bonds are a more important feature. So, yes. Uh, well, normally, this actually makes eight classes, but we often do we want to predict three classes. We have helices, we actually have three types of helices. We have two types of strands or bridges, and we have three types of turns and coils, and we put them all together. So, often, often we do a three class prediction. If you use the as P in this case. Uh, but you could you could do it. Uh, well, actually, if you stride, it's slightly different. Mm. You have uh, you you could also do it like that. You could some of these helices you could put into coil. But uh. and actually, one thing is what is the agreement between these methods? So if you take that's what, well, how how good could you become? So if you take the same structure and ask how much do they agree with each other? You have three different programs for saying, classifying the secondary structure. And they are, that is somehow would be probably an upper limit for how you go to do. I mean, not, not as it had to be, but I think it would be, I mean, you should at least, maybe I suppose that. You see these methods, these fifth stridents are called sixth, is about 95 to 92 to 95% agreement. So it's quite good agreement. It's not that hard, but it's certainly not 100%. And, uh, if you take PDB instead, you actually have low, whatever sets in the PDB headers, you actually have a lower agreement. And then, well, there's some other method that are not as good, that are even, even much lower. So at least these three methods seem to be pretty good. But I agree with each other. But certainly if you train on this method, and then you're going to be evaluated on this method here, you're not, you're not no way you're going to do better than 80%, even if you do perfect predictions. Unless you're lucky. And it's even something here that's down to 76% agree with so. so basically, training should be done on something that are some of these methods. Okay, so if you want to understand this from a physical point of view, as I said, we basically have, we well, you know that protein structure kind of forms by itself. And uh, and this is also what, what people observed. So basically, the key thing is basically the side chain entropy. So basically, how much variation they have in the entropy of the side chain. And uh, so basically, the uh, longer side chain, the, the more restricted motion of side chains, you don't like to be in the helix because in the helix, of course, in half helix, you don't count move so much. When you beat a sheet or a loop, you have more flexibility to move. So the, uh, so the cost of fixing that is, is smaller for, uh, for anthropic, anthropic cost of fixing that is smaller for a short side chain than a long one, and a beta branched side chain that, is, has, to, that has a chain that is branched to other sort of chains, like valine, is even smaller. So that means that alanine likes to be in a helix and valine likes to be in a sheet. Just pure physical. I mean, they're, more, they're all hydrophobic. And isoleucine is more sheet like because it's longer than leucine. Well, it's with brands. So leucine is more hydrophobic than alanine. Versus, so. But there are all the other factors. The things that you have, of course, in helix, you have a dipolar moment. The hydrogen bonds all point in the same direction. So you have a shark there. You have polarity. So you have end capping on this often. The things that you have uh, all this. Here you see all these hydrogen bonds points for the source anyway, so you have a capping on the sides that to contract this, this and dipolar moment. So you can actually look at preferences in a helix, just do a log like we did yesterday, and see what I mean as it's like to be there. So, and you get up to that. You see, it's actually not, you see, for instance, you see that you have the lysine, the short ones are at the C terminus, but not so popular frequent in the N terminus. Alanines and leucines like to be everywhere. Valines are probably uh, somewhere in there. 
the big grammatic meanings are not like at all. Yeah, the tryptophan is done somewhere. Did you see it? And uh, in general, you have negative short amino acids here and positive short amino acids. You have E and D here, they go down here, a little bit and you K and R more here than here. What? Uh, this should be, I hope it is, this should be M terminal, this should be C terminal. And then the position 5 is probably, probably starting the first residue, last residue, and the middle. I, I think that's the way it does. That's the, so if it's, lo, if, it's, if it's less than uh, 9 residues, you skip here. If it's more than 9, you put it all, all in 5. I think that's how they made it. So anyway, but you, you say that you see it's not gigantic differences. They are, they are certainly, they certainly it's more or less the same thing on top of it. And they are, so all amino acids can exist in every position. So it's not an absolute thing that they, oh, I heard this amino acid sequence, you don't have it. But, but it clearly are some patterns. Glycine varies quite a lot, right? It goes from the very prevalent up in the Glycine end. there. Yeah, because the glycine doesn't, doesn't like to be in the middle at all. No, it's because of entropy, right? Uh, because yes. Because you have the unwound. Well, glycine is not really side chain entropy, right? it doesn't have side chain. So it's really because actually glycines are the backbone get become much more flexible. So it means backbone entropy. So glycines somehow prefer to be in the loop region where you need more flexibility. And uh, I guess that if close to the ends there are more loop like things and more flexibility, so that's why you may want to have it there. Uh, proline should be very low all the way because proline really doesn't like to be in the helices, but then they uh, I don't see it here. Mm -hmm. Maybe some, maybe some of these sit down here. <laughs> so they are, uh, but you can uh, and you can do the same thing for beta sheets. The beta sheets, of course, are two types: the parallel and the parallel. And uh, uh, well, there is a mixed ones you can have several things, and yeah, but also here, of course, you have more the side chains, more mobility, so you have more flexibility. And uh, the side chains are bound on two ways. And, but you, you have a similar, well, no, similar idea here. You have, for instance, valine is very popular in the middle. Beta sheets are normal, the spans are normally shorter. So there's rarely are nine residues long, they're most often shorter. But you have, you see, also here you have just said the glycines are there on the ends. And uh, there's no really short bias, but maybe somehow a little bit of KR there. Good on ED are very unpopular, they are not. But generally, they kind of these kind of polar amino acids, serine, threonine, that are kind of liked. And in the middle, they are hydrophobic. Well, in terms, they're different types. They are very specific terms, and there's more loops. Uh, they, so these are, they have these beta type 1 and type 2 terms that are very, very specific by the uh, phi psi angles, and specific polymer proteins, and these are have quite strong preferences for some amino acids on the positions. But if you put them all the terms together, you basically get enough with like a lot of glycines and prolines. Some short amino acids here in the middle, but not at the end of the terms for some reason. And uh, yeah. Uh, but, but particularly a lot of glycines and prolines in the middle. Okay, so this is the, there, are, there are information here for, for the physics, and actually there are methods that basically just try to use the physics to calculate it, and they are not that bad. But uh, so this is just to tell you the answer. How uh, what happened? So in 1974, I guess it was a show first one of the first secondary structure pre program that was developed. I don't know how many structures they had, but it was probably just a handful, maybe 20 of that. So we already had a few structures, and they tried to do calculate the secondary structure prediction for that. And the problem with this is that they really had the rules to really put up. If you have five. I mean, acids out of seven that likes to be in the helix, we call it the helix, um, and we extend the helix until we find a beta that's how it breaks it, so it's really kind of ad hoc.